Good afternoon. I hope you're doing well this afternoon, having a good day. Maybe you got to take a little bit of a nap, maybe a little bit of rest. Maybe you've been doing some work. I don't know, but we're glad that you've decided to log on and join us for a Bible study lesson this hour. We appreciate you very much for doing so. It's been a while since we started these, these uh, sessions when the coronavirus hit. I believe it was in March that uh, I started doing these Facebook lessons. And uh, I would much rather, much rather see people in person, but we know what, what cautions are being taken are necessary. And we're uh, thankful that we have leaders who are careful for us, and caring about us. So we appreciate that very much. We appreciate many of you who've logged on faithfully through all this time and given your encouragement. It's a little bit strange sitting here looking at a computer and it's a little bit different because on uh, on Facebook anyway, when you turn your head this way, it goes the other way. When you turn your head that way, it goes the other way. It's not, it's not like a mirror, so it's a little bit backwards. And it's a little bit confusing for a small mind like mine. But we appreciate your patience with any kind of things that uh, happen over that. Well, I always ramble a little bit at the first to give people time to log on. I was reading Psalms for a while to give people time to log on, and then I quit doing that because we came to a really long one that I thought we might not get in. Maybe I'll just have to start doing that again, and breaking it up a little bit. But tonight I'd like to start in Psalm, Psalm 139, Psalm 139, which is about 111 past where we were, but I'd like to start there tonight. And I'd like to start in verse 1 and read while people are still logging on because then our first scripture for our lesson comes down starting at verse 7. So let's start Psalm 139, verse 1. David says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I just love how in those first six verses, the psalmist is essentially saying, God, you know me better than I know me. You know so much about me that is even beyond my comprehension, my ability to think about and i i love you lord for it god is so far above us we need to appreciate that now then in verses 7 through 10 come uh, comes a passage about the the inability to escape god's notice this morning at hillview we spoke on the omnipotence of god god is all omnipowerful potent he's all powerful tonight we'll speak on the omnipresence of god god is all omnipresent all present or present everywhere. Now, there are some misconceptions about that that we will have to dispense of at, all, along our way and try to get at the actual truth of what the scriptures teach about the omnipresence of God. Let's start here in Psalm 139, verse 7, reading down through verse 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. This is highly poetic language that indicates that no one can get away from the view, from the vision, from the knowledge of God. There are some people that might take this a little bit too literally and be confused. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? That's pretty straightforward. They're rhetorical questions that mean nowhere can I go away from God's presence. But then verse 8, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. That makes sense. We all believe and know that God is in heaven. But then the next line gives us a little bit of pause. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. You've heard preachers preach. You may have heard me preach from time to time that God is a holy God and cannot be in the presence of wickedness. That's why there is punishment. That's why there is wrath. That's why there is a place called hell, a place prepared for the devil and his angels, a, place, a lake of fire and brimstone where those who are not written in the book of life will be cast. That's the place, the everlasting place, the final punishment for all the wicked. 
Well, then why in the world would the psalmist say, if I make my bed in hell, you, God, are there? First of all, it's a translation issue. The word there translated hell is not translated that in every translation. Because the Hebrew word does not really refer to the place of the wicked. It refers to the place of the dead, if you will, or even more, uh, more graphically, a pit out of which despair never ends. The Sheol, the, the hell, the place, the pit, it might also be translated. And sometimes it is translated Sheol. In Psalm 16, verse 10, it's probably the same word. I forgot to look it up, but I believe it's probably the same word where the prophecy is that Jesus' body would not be left in the grave. You, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Some translations would say you will not leave my soul in hell, or you will not leave my soul in the pit. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. And then people take that and a misunderstanding of Ephesians 4 to say that Jesus actually went to hell when he died, the eternal abode of the wicked. No, that's not what that verse means. In Greek thought, there was the Hadean realm, which was the realm of the dead, and Hades ruled over it. That was pagan thought before Christ came along. But the words, nevertheless, came to mean something in real Christian teaching when the Hadean realm came to mean the place of the dead. And so we see in Hades, in the New Testament, sometimes that's actually a better translation. You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And Hades could have a couple of different layers to it. One, paradise, where the good would go. And then two, Tartarus, referred to in Second Peter chapter 2, where the evil would go. Well, Jesus had said to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. The psalmist then, putting all that together, and try in poetry not to be too literal with what somebody is saying, the psalmist then is saying, wherever I go, God is going to be there. If I go to heaven, I would expect him to be there. But even if I go to the realm of the dead, or even if he's not literally talking about the dead, but he just goes to the pit, he just goes far out of what anybody would think God would ever see to hide goes to some miserable place where, that seems to be dark, seems to be deep, seems to be like a dungeon, anywhere like that, God is still going to know. it. He's not saying God is in hell. He's not saying Christ is in hell. He's not saying he's hiding in hell. He's just talking about a deep, dark place where he would try to hide, but he can't because God knows it, and God is in every place in the world that we know today, every place on earth, every place in the heavens, heaven and earth making up the atmosphere and the firm ground and the sea. He's everywhere. That's what he says in the next verse. Even if I take the wings of the morning, and I don't even know what that means, the wings of the morning, a poetic phrase to, to say that in the morning I'll go be up with the birds, maybe, and then dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. You know, some of those depths of the sea can get miles and miles deep. Even if I were there, I can't hide from God. Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Now some other passages that might be a little bit easier to understand about God's, about God's omnipresence. Let's look at those. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. You can turn along with me if you like. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Now, I like to stop right there. I've used it for different points before because it makes so many different points. But notice what it says so far. He inhabits eternity. One author wrote that the omnipresence of God means that God is in space and in time. He is at all points in time and every place in space. You can't get away from him. God does not exist just from 1910 to 2000, like a lot of people might, or 1950 to 2025 or something like that. God is at every point in time that ever was because he created time and he was before time. He'll be after time. He inhabits eternity. Then he's also in space. In this particular place, he tells where he is in space. I dwell in the high and holy place with him 
who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God is at every place, but he also chooses to be with a humble person. Now that gets more specific in the Christian age in that he is with the Christian. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. Now that Psalm would have been written about a thousand years before Christ. Isaiah would have been written about 700 years before Christ. And Jeremiah would have been written about five to 600 years before Christ. And in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24, at a different time, at a different place, or at least close to a different place, God says, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Well, which is it? Is he near? Or is he far? Yes, he is. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? There's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no, nobody can hide from God. And then he says, do I not fill heaven and earth? Don't you love that? Don't you stand in awe of that? Do I not fill heaven and earth? I'm with the humble and contrite one, but I inhabit eternity. You can't find any secret place because I inhabit in heaven and earth. And then 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. Also back to about a thousand years before Christ, this is the time that Solomon was dedicating the temple that he had built. And in the midst of that speech, Solomon says this, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. He's asking God to dwell there, but he makes the acknowledgement that needs to be made. That God cannot be confined to that temple. God cannot be confined to earth. God cannot be confined to heaven. God is everywhere. Heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. What a figure of speech to say that God cannot be marked down as being at one particular place at one particular time. And then let's go to the New Testament, Acts chapter 17, verse 27 and 28, passage that we noted in connection with God's omnipotence this morning, but a great passage. God, you know, can pack so much into just a few words and inspiration. This is Paul's inspired speech on Mars Hill in Athens to a bunch of non-believers, to a bunch of pagans. He says, well, let's start at verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord. God wants people to seek him in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. God's not far from us. Now, how do we know? Because we're breathing, because we're moving. In him, we live and we move and have our being. Even people who aren't believers have God close to them, have God in a sense, in a sense, in them, because you don't live, move, and breathe without him. And because every human being is made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. So God inhabits eternity, fills heaven and earth. Heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain him. And yet he's with the, with the humble one. And in a sense, he's with everyone who's made in his image. Now then, let's get a little bit more specific. Let's say some things that omnipresence is not. It is not just knowledge about every place. It is not as if God just sits in heaven and knows about every place on earth. I know that there is a Paris. I've never been there. I'm not there now, but I know there is a Paris. This is not a description of the omnipresence of God. It's not that God knows about earth and sits back and studies about it. No, he's there. I know a little about different cities in West Virginia, small town in Pennsboro, know a little about Parkersburg, know something about Moundsville, something about Wheeling. I'm in Moundsville right now, but I'm not in Wheeling, I'm not in Parkersburg, I'm not in Pennsboro. So when I say I know about those places, I'm still not there. When we say omnipresence, that doesn't mean God just knows about certain places. He is there, all of those places at all of those times. Also, this is not pantheism. Pantheism says that God, a little bit of God, 
is in everything you see, or everything you see is a God. You probably know, remember some of you who grew up uh, a little bit younger than I am, or maybe you were parents about the same time I was raising, raising kids about the same time I was raising kids, and Disney came out with the movie Pocahontas. And one of the lines from her theme song was, I know every rock and tree and forest has a life, has a spirit, has a name. Well, that's pantheism. Every rock has a spirit, a life, a name. No, that's not true. In Christian teaching, in godly teaching, it's not true. But that's the idea of pantheism, is that God is in everything. God is in this little pulpit. God is in this computer. God, this computer has its own life force and is God. That tree outside the window where I'm looking has its own life force and is God. No, that sounds awfully close to the idea of omnipresence, but it is quite polarly opposite. It's pantheism, that everything is God. I'm not God. Christ, I believe, dwells in me. The scripture teaches that, but I'm not Christ and I'm not God. God dwells in me, but I'm not God. So there's a big difference between omnipresence and pantheism. And God might be in different places, but not in the same sense. If every person has God in the sense that he's made in the image of God, then someone as sinful as Nero, the mad emperor who killed Christians, had God with him somehow. But that's not in the same sense that God is in the Christian, whom he tells, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And still that is not in the same fuller sense that God the Father was in God the Son, you see. So there are different senses about all that. By saying God is in the sinner, I'm using language I haven't heard anywhere before, so I want to really qualify that. I don't mean that God is approving the sinner. I don't mean that God is dwelling with wickedness. I simply mean what Paul said in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, that in him we live and move and have our very being. Paul wasn't only talking about Christians there. He was talking to a group of philosophers that weren't Christians at all, that were pagans, that worshipped idols. And he said, in him we live and move and have our very being. God breathed into Adam the breath of life. And from then on, God has made man in his image. Well, as he did Adam, God has made man in his image. So there's something about God in us, but not in the same sense as God dwells in the Christian, and certainly not in the same sense that God was in Christ. Then we also need to note that God is not divided into elements. In Isaiah chapter 66, and verse 1, the Bible, God says, Heaven is my throne. And earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Heaven's my throne and earth is my footstool. Isn't that a good, isn't that a good comparison? Heaven is my throne. That's where I'm sitting. And I got to rest my feet somewhere. So that's earth. But where where's the place that you'll build for me? You can't build any place adequate for me. All the fancy temples and cathedrals that we might build are not places of God. God does not dwell in temples made with hands, Paul said in Acts 17, a little bit further in his speech. No, God is everywhere. You can't contain him. But notice what he says in verse 2. For all those things my hand has made, made heaven and earth, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Man's got to get rid of his pride for God to dwell with him in a better sense than just being with everybody. God dwells with that humble person. Today, he dwells with that humble Christian. Now, there are people who teach differently than this. One book from another group of, of people, another group who corrupts some of the doctrines of God, says this. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. The Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. God's flesh and bones, that book says. Book of Doctrines and Covenants, I'm told. But then the Bible says this, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 24. Jesus said after his resurrection, when people were questioning whether he was really there in front of them, he said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. They thought Jesus was a ghost. No, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. 
So it's not as if God's body is in heaven and his personage on earth or something like that. No, God is a spirit. And he's everywhere. That ought to strike some awe in us. Lanier says in his book, The Timeless Trinity, well, he's quoting the scholar Strong, who says, we reject the Socinian representation. The Socinians were an early group of heretics that denied that Christ was divine, denied that Christ was God. We reject the Socinian representation that God's essence is in heaven, only his power on earth. They said, see, God's in heaven because the Bible says God's in heaven. So when it says he's on earth, that means only his power is there. He said, we reject that. When God is said to, quote, dwell in the heavens, unquote, we are to understand the language either as a symbolic expression of exaltation above earthly things. That is, God's not limited to this earth. He's not corrupted by this earth the way a lot of people are. He's in the heavens, symbolically. Or we are to understand it as a declaration that his most special and glorious self-manifestations are to the spirits of heaven. From this, it follows that the whole logos, logos means word, and that's what Jesus is called in John chapter 1. The whole logos can be united to and be present in the man Christ Jesus, while at the same time, he fills and governs the whole universe. And the whole Christ can be united to and be present in the single believer as fully as if that believer were the only one to receive of his fullness. Now, that's where my mind starts to be blown. God was fully in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, In him, that's in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Godhead. In him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, which is spirit, bodily. They're all there in that one man that walked in Galilee some 2,000 years ago and died on the cross. And yet God fills heaven and earth, so they're not confined to that one man. And yet God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are in the believers, the obedient believers, as we'll see from scriptures in a moment to follow. Now, if that doesn't strike in us a sense of awe, I don't know what would. Some people would dismiss it because of that. Well, that's just too ridiculous. I can't believe that. No, God is reasonable and he gives us reason to believe in him. But there is a sense of awe that we come across in our studies. Otherwise, God wouldn't be God. He'd just be one of us. But he's different from us. Holy and awesome is his name. Psalm 111 verse 9. Holy and reverend is his name. Is the King James. Most other translations have holy and awesome is his name. That means we stand back and we don't believe with blind faith. We believe with reasoned faith. But when we realize what we believe, then our jaws drop at utter amazement at the power and the presence of Almighty God. Now, God dwells in his people. Let's consider a few passages from the New Testament. When the New Testament came along, the Old Testament was fulfilled, nailed to the cross, and the New Covenant came along, and all people are amenable to Christ. It's still true, then, that people are made in the image of God, but if people want to be humble before God and have a contrite spirit and have him dwelling with them, then they will submit themselves to the Christ the way God has said to do. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will abide in my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Did you catch that? If anyone abides in my word, does what I say, then we, the Father and I, will come to him and make our home with him. They'll abide with the person who keeps his word. Not with the person who just believes, not with the person who is flipping about it, but the person who keeps his word. And then 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, the letter, the epistle, 1 John. Chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we know it's not just a, a flippant confession because of what he said earlier about keeping his word. So there's more to it than that. If you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, you're going to follow his way. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. 
God dwells in that person. Then 2 John, verse 9, we often look at it in the negative, but watch the positive of it. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. See, if you go beyond and don't keep his word, you don't have God. But then he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Many of you can probably quote because there is a song that we sing often that goes that, that simply explains the words or, or simply says the words. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm alive, but only because I gave up myself and Christ is in me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, the Apostle Paul is speaking in, in, by way of introduction to the rest of that letter. He says to these people, and starting in verse 21, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. God has given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And then Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Galatians, Paul wrote to some people who were struggling with uh, whether or not to keep some of the old law or not. And he's saying to them, no, 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 you keep the new law. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, he describes them as sons of God in that new law. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The most tender thing a son can say to a, a dad, Abba, Abba. It's before he even learns dad, 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 dad. God has sent the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Then there's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. And the subject, what well, the subject matter is sexual immorality and staying away from it. In verse 18, Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside his body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That passage just takes away any kind of Gnostic idea that you can serve God with your spirit while not serving him with your body. No, you got to be in this whole hall, if you will, body and spirit. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, well, that'd be God. If the spirit of God dwells in you, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The whole idea there is power to live. These Christians might be thinking, we don't have the power to live the kind of life we ought to live. God says, look, God is life. I'm life. I raised Christ from the dead. That's power. And that same power is in you through my spirit. So then all three of the Godhead are in all Christians in all the world at the same time. God fills heaven and earth. The heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain him. He's with those who have a humble and contrite spirit. He fills every Christian in the United States of America, Iraq, Afghanistan, Russia, Mongolia, all the nations in the world, wherever there's a Christian, he fills them. God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit fill them all at the same time in every age, in every era. Now, people will ask how. Not, most often they debate about how the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And I've addressed that before. So let me just say this now. Why don't we argue about how Christ dwells in us? Why don't we argue about how God dwells in us? Because they all three do, according to those scriptures. He is everywhere. But he's not only in Christians, you know, his image is still in those, and he, he provides life to people who are even not following him. 
He knows what's going on in the deepest pits. He knows what's going on in the deepest prisons. He knows what's going on in the heavens. He knows what's going on on the earth. He knows what's going on in my heart. He sees right past any superficial things that I might do. And he knows what's going on in my heart. Matthew chapter 5 is all about how God knows what's in your heart. Sin starts in the heart and then comes out into action after it's festered in the heart for a while. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, the Apostle Paul speaking about separating ourselves from evil. God says through Paul, And what agreement has the temple of God, that's the person, with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the church. That's Christians. I'll dwell in them. I'll be among them. They shall be my God. Or, or I, I shall be their God. They shall be my people. That's the promise that the Christian has. What's that mean to us? It's impossible to escape it. If there are hypocritical Christians, they need, they need to quit. They need to repent of being hypocrites and serve God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because he knows. He knows what you did Saturday night, knows what you did Friday night, knows what you're thinking Wednesday morning, knows what you're thinking Thursday at work. He knows everything, and he's with us all the time. That ought to cause us a little bit of fear, but for the Christian, it ought to cause a lot of comfort. Face that evil person who tries to disparage you because of your faith. God's with you. Face a group of peers who really want to drag you down because you won't agree to the same immoral things at which they're agreeing in a school discussion. God's with you. He's there in the presence of everyone. He knows what they're doing to you. But in a special way, God in his fullness is in you. As long as you follow his word and obey him. How do you get God to be in you? Well, you read about people becoming Christians in the Bible. And you have that promise in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, that those who obey him will have the Holy Spirit in them. We are also witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Christ came to this earth. God was manifest in the flesh. Hard for me to comprehend. But he was here. And if you were there in the first century and you looked on Christ, you were looking at the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him bodily. But yet God was still in heaven because he could pray to him and God was there to answer. And the Holy Spirit was still in heaven because Christ said, when I leave you, I'll send you the Holy Spirit. And so it just boggles our mind as it ought to because God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways yet we know these things because of the evidence that is that God is there in natural revelation and because of the evidence that the Bible is his special revelation we take these things that he says we believe them we trust them we rejoice in them if we read in the Bible what they were supposed to do to be Christians, to have God, Christ, and the Spirit dwelling in them, then we do the same thing. That is to confess that Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth, died a horrible death, rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, from which point he poured out the Holy Spirit on his apostles, and they started preaching, and they preached the message that whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. They preached the message Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 16, and then Acts 2, verse 38. They preached that message. Why should we do anything different? To have the God who fills the heaven and the earth in us. But then, there's complication. If we sin willfully after we received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, Hebrews 10, 26 says. Yet, 
First John chapter one, verse seven through nine says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And our fellowship was with his son, Jesus Christ. His blood cleanses us from all sins. First John one, one through four and one, seven through nine. So what, if we're trying to do our best and we stumble, God will forgive us. That forgiveness makes it possible for him to be with us because he can't be in the presence of sin. But if we turn our backs on him willfully, that forgiveness is not present. And he won't be buoying us. He won't be cheering us on. He won't be helping us the way he had helped us when we were faithful to him. There may be people who are not Christians. We'd love to talk with you about being a Christian. The God of the universe is not just a God of deism that's far off somewhere that just wound up the world and watches it go carelessly by. He cares for each soul and wants you to be with him for eternity, and he wants to inhabit you in that special way now. But he leaves that up to you. We talk about the omnipotence of God. Talk about how powerful he is. And then realize that he gave you the power to choose your own way and reject him. That power of rejection comes from God. Because what he wants is for you to choose to love him. And you can't choose that if you don't have the opposite as a choice as well. Stand in awe that you're able to think and choose. And then submit humbly to the God who has all power, who will judge the universe someday. Judge you and me someday. If we don't have him dwelling with us now, we can't dwell with him then. Be a Christian. Believe and repent and confess and be baptized for the remission of your sins and be faithful. When you stumble, ask for forgiveness, but never, ever turn away from him. You can be with this amazing, all-powerful God for all eternity. Let us know if we can help you. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for enriching us so much with the food that we eat, the rain and the sunshine that we receive, the breath that we breathe. Beyond all that, we're amazed that you offer us the opportunity to be your children, to have you dwelling in us in a very special way. We pray, Father, that we might be pleasing to you, that we will humble ourselves and obey your word so that you and Christ would come and make your home with us. And then in turn, that we might be at home with you someday after judgment is complete and you find us sinless not because of our sinlessness, but because of Christ's blood covering us. Look forward to that opportunity. But while we're here, Father, help us to fight the good fight of faith through whatever enemies may show themselves against us, through whatever challenges there may be of heart, of spirit, and of flesh. Help us to fight faithfully, knowing that the fight is not our own, but yours and you have already won the battle. Help us to fight with that in mind. We give you thanks and honor and glory at all times. Thank you for your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. If we could help you, please let us know. Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, Lord willing, I'll be here with a kids class and then following that uh, in a teen and adult class. Hope you have a good week till then. Pray, pray hard. It's in Christ's name we pray. Sorry I messed up there, but I uh, hope you forgive me. You know what I mean. Pray and pray hard for everybody about you. And for God's word to be changing people's lives all around you. It's in Christ's name. I did it again. Have a good night.